We have been, over the last few months, using a theme to find out who we are, what God thinks of those who are his people. We began with a clip from Toy Story 2 where uh, Stinky Pete comments that Woody really doesn't know who he is. And we have delved into a number of different biblical titles and phrases and symbols that God uses to refer to his people in hopes of better understanding who we are. And so that's what we've been doing, and today I want to uh, wrap that up. I, I just am so hopeful that as we've looked at that, maybe you've gotten a glimpse of uh, what God has challenged you to become and how his power can enable you to be more than you think you are, because that's been my objective and my hope in all of this. For one's new identity truly is... Uh, the greatest joy story that there is. The fact that I am not who I once was, the fact that I'm a new creature in Jesus Christ, that, that is astonishing. So as uh, we wrap that whole thing up, before moving on to our next uh, series of study, and I want to begin with this question, who are you? Who are you? And I, you can think about that in reality. How would you answer someone asking who you are? And as you do that, I, I think we're typically going to do a number of things. We might get, uh, we might get real theological about it and, you know, and, and, and go from the spiritual perspective. And that's, that's accurate. That hopefully is some of who we are. We may be you know, a little more uh, physical about it. We may describe our, our person. Uh, we may be even uh, occupational about it. Uh, here's who I am, or this is what I do. Uh, that may become some of how we would answer who we are. There's any number of ways that we could answer and respond to that question. My guess is that nobody is going to give the answer that I'm going to offer uh, this morning. That you, you didn't just think about this one on your own. This, this statement may shock you. It may not. I had never thought about it this plainly before. So it kind of took me back to even just process this. So it, it, may, it may strike you in that fashion as well. And, but here, here's some of who you are. You are as much a creation of God as Adam and Eve were. And I appreciate you know, Sebastian beginning in Genesis 1-1. This whole thing of God's creative work is, is, is a marvel. But who am I, even without my desire for spirituality, I'm a creation of God. I am as much a creation of God as were his first creation, Adam and Eve. The difference is that God formed Adam and Eve from the dust of the ground, and for the most part, you and I are formed by God with a human process that he designed and he put in place. Yet, even though that's some of how we are put together, guess what we return to? We return to the same dust that God made Adam and Eve out of. The foreboding arrogance of humanity says that every human is nothing but the result of a male and female union, and you are simply the result of biology. And so if that question were asked on the, on the campus at UNL, who are you? people would probably have a tendency to respond something much more humanistic than what we would say gathered in a church assembly. So strongly, I think, has that perception permeated the world around us that humans, by and large, believe that they have the right to tweak the process, to bypass the process, or even to fully end the process without there being any ramifications. In other words, we are just such biological beings that if, if, if I want to end a pregnancy, that's just my call. Because it's nothing but biology. If we reach a point where science wants to say, if you want a blue-eyed, blonde-haired baby, we can give it to you. You see, again, we are tweaking something much bigger than what is just biologically possible. Social norms say that humans are no more than biologically formed entities. Therefore, society is obligated, and again, 
If we truly believe that we're nothing more than biology, then the society of the biological beings is responsible to legitimize every desire of every biological being, right? If that's all we are. If all we are is biological, then whatever this biological thing wants, society has to say, it's all right. And we are watching as society seeks to adjust to that way of thought and thinking. This elevated pursuit of every human desire is not a philosophy that is peculiar to postmodern society. We may think, oh, this is, this is a great result of the, of the evolution of human understanding. It's what's been around since time began. Adam and Eve believed they needed to satisfy their desire that they were nothing more than biological, and they could become like God. <laughs> and so the trial was real. The test was real. All the things that Sebastian mentioned this morning, all the liars down through history, all of the turmoil. Why? Because humanity believes that if we're just biological, if you take God out of the picture, then whatever this biology wants is all right. I want to come back to the statement, though. You are as much a creation of God as Adam and Eve. The biblical truth is that God molded the first human beings, and his hands are just as active in creating every subsequent human. Oh, he's not taking dirt and making them anymore. But look at, look at the words of the psalmist. For it was you, speaking of God, who created my inward parts, you knit me together in my mother's womb, and I will praise you because I have been remarkably and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and I know them full well. My bones were not hidden from you when I was made in secret. When I was formed in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw me when I was formless. All my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began God, how difficult your thoughts are for me to comprehend. How vast their sum is. If I counted them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I wake up, I'm still with you. A human embryo does develop physically. But that's, that's not the point of discussion today. The point of discussion is the physical development of a human embryo is but one form of what goes into making a human being. Solomon offers some additional insight when he said, as you do not know the way the spirit comes to the bones in the womb of a woman with child, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. Wise man Solomon says, you have no idea how the spirit gets in, into the bones of a developing fetus. No idea how that happens. And then in chapter 12, Solomon's discussing how important it is that while we have, before all of these things happen that age brings on, how important it is to remember before the silver cord is snapped and the golden bowl is broken and the jar is shattered at the spring and the well is broken into the well and the dust returns to the earth as it once was. And what happens to the spirit? It returns to God who gave it. Put those two passages together by the same author in the same book. And what Solomon said is, God puts a spirit in a developing human being while it's in the womb. And when that same human being dies, that spirit's ready to go back to God. That's what the book says. Job will put it this way. <laughs> He's lamenting the turmoil that's come his way. And he said, why wasn't I born dead? Why didn't I die as I came out of the womb? Why was I laid on my mother's lap? And why did she nurse me at her breast? Had I died at birth? I would now be at peace. 
I would be asleep and at rest. I would rest with the world's kings and the prime ministers whose great buildings now lie in ruins. Before I move to the next part of that text, here's what I want you to see. Job says, if I would have been a miscarried child, I would be where dead kings and princes are right now. I have a child in the arms of God that I never met. Many in this room have a child in the arms of God that you never got to meet. And that verse tells me that. That verse says that embryo is more than biological. It has a spirit. He continues, I would rest with princes rich in gold whose palaces are filled with silver. Why wasn't I buried like a stillborn child? Okay, so what's all that mean? Let's put, let's put that together. Every vocal atheist, boisterous unbeliever, and profound humanist were all assembled by the hand of God. This has nothing to do with what you choose to do with God. You are still made by God. You are still put together by God. Oh, biological, yes. But you cannot explain biologically spirits and souls. You can't get there. The Bible says God is involved in doing that work in the biology of human development. So regardless of where people are, they are made in the image of God. And folks, that's why we need to be concerned about the heathens, about the lost, because everyone was put together by God. This is an imperative truth which is foundational to understanding the deeper truths concerning life and redemption. This lies at the very, very core of how I'm going to become a new creature, name something different by God. Everyone had an equally sinless beginning because the Holy Father was weaving together another one of his creations. By the way, that's why children spiritually, they're just safe. They're just pure because they, they were just knit together by the hand of God. And apparently it takes some time because Jesus said adults need to be converted and become like children if they desire to see the kingdom of heaven. So it takes some time to lose that. Initially, we are the creation of God, period, in pureness and in goodness. Passages that would contribute to this discussion would include passages like Jeremiah chapter 1. The word of the Lord came to me. I chose you before I formed you in the womb and I set you apart before you were born. Hmm. Jeremiah, I'm going to call you to do some things. And by the way, Jeremiah is called to do some really odd things. I've called you to do some things, but guess what? I set that all up when I was making you. Or how about Paul's statement in Galatians chapter 1? But when God who from my mother's womb set me apart, had called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me so that I could preach him among the Gentiles. In the womb, Paul says, God had set me apart for this purpose. And then later on, he called me to that very purpose. Everyone had an equally sinless beginning because in you the Holy Father was weaving together another of his creation. Scripture will show that while this is the beginning place of all human life, the draw of fleshly desires inaugurated in the kingdom of self quickly corrupts what the creator has created. Romans chapter 1, for God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all godlessness and unrighteousness of people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Since what can be known about God is evident among them because God has shown it to them. From the creation of the world, his invisible attributes and his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. I want to challenge you to do something because most of us, I think, when we read that, you know, we think, yeah, you look at, you go outside and look at the stars at night, and you've, you've, got, you've got evidence of God. Do you, know, do you know what I see in that text? When you look at yourself, you have evidence of God. 
And the only way you don't have that evidence is if, if you decide what Scripture says, to suppress the truth. God has made it so obvious that you are not just biological, that you have been put together by Him, that if you don't get it, it's because you don't want it. It's not something that can't be understood. It's something that we decide we don't want to understand. So he continues, for though they knew God, what, no, just a minute. He's talking about people suppressing truth. And now then he says they knew God. How did they know God? Because that's the way he created them. He built them with that understanding of God. Although they knew God, they did not glorify him or show gratitude. Instead, their thinking became what? Nonsense. We're nothing but biological creatures. Nonsense. And their senseless minds were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. And they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men. So therefore, God delivered them over to the cravings of their heart, to sexual impurity, so that their bodies would be, were degraded among themselves. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and they worshiped and served something created instead of the Creator, who is blessed forever. First of all, God has shown His attributes, power, and nature clearly. That's what the text says. It's obvious, not hidden. And it is shown in what He has made. That would include every human being's construction, what he has put together. And so he says people are without excuse because they knew God but did not glorify him or show gratitude. Their thinking became nonsense, he says. Senseless minds were darkened. This whole, this whole idea of human wisdom that leads us to a greater understanding that takes God totally out of the picture and makes us all biological wizards is darkness. Darkness. And they exchanged the wonders of an immortal God for a mortal man. In doing this, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. This dark, darkened, denying, ignorant, senseless, mortal walk became the path of all who began as creatures of the Creator. God molded every human being with his hands. We were born with a full, full beauty of God's creative ability. But because of this world's influence, we reach a point where we walk in darkness, where we don't understand God's involvement. Ephesians chapter 5, Paul will write, you were once darkness. He doesn't, I, I, I chose that passage to, to reference because he doesn't say you were in darkness. He says you were darkness. You were it. You were the epitome of senseless thought. God was not part of your consideration at all. Colossians 1 verse 13 says that we've been rescued from the dominion of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of light, his dear son Jesus. And Peter will say that we've been called out of darkness. So humans assembled by the hand of God are born into this world and the darkness of this world overtakes the purity of God's creation because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And even this ties in. For since death came through a man or just as in Adam, all die. Like Adam and Eve, every human being has left the garden of God's holy creation and followed after their own darkened will. We had our personal garden of Eden. We were his creation. We were made holy. He put us all together. But then something happened. Darkness overtook us. Sin overtook us. As in Adam, sin brought about death. It's while within the grasp of this darkness that we become totally separated from God. And we earn the wage of that separation, which is death. 
If you have not ever thought all of this in this fashion, this makes some biblical things so astonishing to me. Redemption. God made us like we were supposed to be. We decided that's not how we wanted to be. He redeemed us. Grace. Forgiveness. Salvation. Words that roll off of our tongue, sometimes just too easily. God is broken hearted by the departure. And he wants everyone who departs to come back. He's the one that put us together. And so we would find Peter making reference. Some people were saying, oh, your God's just so slow. He's not doing what he's promised. And Peter says, hey, it's not slow. God just doesn't want anybody to perish. Jesus is coming again. The world's going to be destroyed. These things are going to be burned up. That's all going to happen. And guess why it hasn't happened? There's only one reason it hasn't happened. It's because God still longs for people to be saved and come back to him. Luke chapter 15, remember the parable of the father and the two sons and the prodigal who leaves. Remember what the father does as he watches that road awaiting the return. That's God. And James uses some extremely unique and very understandable language when he says, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? I created you. I put you together. Here you are born into this world and you let the biology become the main thing and that's nothing but making you my enemy because what you're doing is you're separating yourself from me. But look at what he says, verse 5. He yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. God is jealous over the spirit that he gave us to come back to him. God is jealous to recreate that original spiritual purity placed into every human. He longs for us to seek him again, to seek him through truth, to seek him through the light that he has provided. Just how badly, God, do you long for that? Just how much do you want that? For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son. So that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. That's how much. <laughs> That's how much. Oh, and by the way, do not think for a moment that God is forcing Jesus into this. Because Philippians chapter 2 says that Jesus emptied himself. He's part of God. God's love wasn't just that he sent Jesus. God's love was that God came. God did not send his son into the world that he might condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Jesus did not come here to establish the standard of condemnation. You know why? Because you did that on your own. <laughs> I've done that on my own. Look at anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned. Why? Because the part that God put in me when he created me, I have corrupted and polluted by this biological world. I have brought on my own condemnation. This then is the judgment. <laughs> Here's how Jesus judges. The light has come into the world and the people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who practices wicked things hates the light and avoids it so that his deeds may not be exposed. The purpose of Jesus coming was he was going to be light. But anyone who lives by the truth that comes to the light so that his works may be shown to be accomplished by God. God's gift of Jesus was not necessary to bring condemnation to humanity. Humanity already had condemned themselves. Jesus was the light that was shining the truthful way for mankind to find their way out of that darkness, out of that self-condemnation, and their way back to what God had created them as. That's what Jesus came to do, was to send the light that would have the power to do away with the darkness. But 
Jesus said in John chapter 3, not everybody wants that. Not everybody wants that. It was through Jesus that humanity would be offered the opportunity to be born again, restoring God's original handiwork. Isn't that an interesting phrase, born again? We've, we've got this conversation with Nicodemus, remember? And, and, and Jesus says, unless a man's born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Nick, how, can I, how can I be born? I can't go to my mother's womb and be born again. What's he thinking about? Biological. <laughs> What's Jesus talking about? God's work, putting this, this human life together and sending them to, to earth. God did that perfectly. You were in, you were his creation, made perfectly, brought into a world that condemned you. So what do you need to do? You need to be born again. Why born again? Because that's how God made you in the first place. Jesus replied, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And I assure you, unless someone is born of the water and the spirit, Jesus answers Nicodemus' question, that he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh. Whatever is born of the spirit is spirit. So how does one escape the self-condemnation of their deceived, distorted, and darkened world? It all begins by hearing about the light that entered into the world of darkness. That's what scripture says. Jesus came as the light to expose the darkness. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, but if in fact our gospel is veiled, Paul will write, it is veiled to those who are perishing, those who don't want it. He's not saying our gospel is not understood by people who are lost. He's saying our, our gospel if it's veiled, if it's not understood, it's because people don't want to understand it. It's because they're making that choice. Regarding them, the God of the age has done what? He has blinded the minds of the unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel and the glory of Christ. What have we just been looking at? This world brings us into a state of darkness. Jesus came as the light. And now here is Paul saying, if you don't see the lights because you don't want to. For God said the light shall shine out of darkness and he has shown in our hearts to give light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. Once exposed to the knowledge of God's glory, witnessed in the light of Christ, one needs to decide that they're going to accept or believe the content of that enlightened understanding. I hear about the light, so now I've got to decide if I, if I hear about this light, and if I'm going to be receptive to this light and not shut up in darkness, then I have to make a choice, I'm going to believe what I understand here. I'm, I'm going to accept what I'm hearing. And so, Scripture will say, Jesus will actually be the one who says it. He told them, I'm from above. You are of the world, and I'm not of this world. Therefore, I told you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. You see, we hear about this light but then there has, to be, there has to be a confidence that this is really what life is all about. It's not just about this biological person. The one who believes in Jesus rejects their own distorted, darkened, nonsensical thinking and migrates into his truthful light. In other words, I now believe what he has said, so I begin to, to move my, that direction. I begin to walk in what I now believe because it's so much different than the darkness that I had come to believe. The mental migration results in a new way of thinking, which in turn begins to demonstrate itself in the change of direction and activity. Scripture identifies that as the process of repentance. And so we read when Paul wrote to the Corinthians in the first letter and he challenged them to make some corrections. We read about how this repentance works spiritually. He says, I rejoice not because you were grieved. The first letter made them upset, sorrowful. But because you were grieved into repenting. In other words, I hear about the light. I begin to believe the light. And now then, I'm so saddened by my time in the darkness that I long to walk in the light now. I want to see things differently. I rejoice for you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. And there it is. I hear about this light. I believe. And I begin to head and to walk in the direction of that light. 
and I have no regrets about this. I have no withholdings about this. This is the way I want to live my life because I'm more than biology. As one strengthens their journey into the light of Jesus, their conviction continues to develop and mature. Jesus taught that the mouth speaks out of the overflow of the heart. And so what happens is, as one hears, believes all this, this light talk and begins to generate their life in that direction, it's like, okay, this is what's now in my heart, and guess what? My mouth can't keep quiet about this anymore. And so Jesus will say in Matthew chapter 10, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before the Father. We will read in Romans chapter 10 that if you confess you with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that you'll be saved. This, this overflow of the heart comes out of our mouth. And a good example of this is the Ethiopian who is being taught by Philip. He teaches him about Jesus. And then the question that comes out of the Ethiopian's mouth is, here is water. Why can't I be baptized? And Philip says, if you believe, you may. And he answers Philip and he says, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I am more than biology. I believe that. And then the scripture says, both he and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. And he went on his way rejoicing. For the transformation to be completed, there must be that moment that Jesus referenced when he spoke to Nicodemus. The moment when we're born of water and spirit. Jesus taught his disciples that whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. The very first sermon the disciples preached contained that same teaching. And so Peter explains to a group of Jews that they had crucified the Son of God, but God had raised him up. And why had God raised him up? The reason God raised him up is because God wants you back. And so when they heard that message, they were sorrowful. Remember what sorrow they were pierced in the heart. Sorrow that breeds repentance is what God looks for. And look at the message then that Peter gives. Peter and the rest of the apostles said, Brothers, repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus the Messiah, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. They needed to finish the rebirth. It's been a process. It's been a process of hearing. It's been a process of believing. It's been a process of beginning to walk differently. It's been a process of, of the overflow of the heart coming out of the mouth. But now then, there needs to be the completion, the moment of rebirth. It is baptism that cleans the conscience from the fleshly control and saves the darkened mind. That's what Peter said, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. Baptism is an answer to God for a clear conscience. Why do I need a clear conscience? Because if I don't clear this thing, guess, what I, guess what's up there? Condemnation, darkness. So it's got to be, it's got to be made clean, and that's what Peter says happens. It is the moment when Paul's sins were washed away, when Adonis told him, to arise and to wash away his sins. It is the moment, according to Romans chapter 6 and verse 3, that puts us into Christ. Our conformity to the death, burial, and resurrection is the gospel message that Paul preached in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In baptism, one dies to self, the corrupt self, the darkened self, buries that dead, that corrupt self, then is resurrected to a newness of life, a new name. I am now... Adopted. I am now a believer. I am now the dwelling of God. I am now a servant. I am now righteous. I am now holy. Because it's a new life. It's born again. It's the way God made me in the very beginning. And I'm coming back to that. It is the moment of returning to the condition in which God made us. We are redeemed. We're bought back. We are saved. Saved from what? <laughs> Ourselves. So by coming back to this moment of rebirth, we save ourselves by our obedience. We are born again as we originally were. So as we end our lesson on what God wants to call those who are his, the question is this, do you need a new identity that is for eternity and beyond? A new identity that is the greatest joy story of your life. 
Are you in, in, in need of getting renamed today? Believe his saving gospel, to walk in the light of that gospel, to verbalize your trust in that gospel, and to die to your darkened self and live in the light of the gospel. God wants for you to come back to the way he made you. That's what God longs for. God wants you to be who he made you. Today, we end our series on what God calls us by an appeal to let God call us those things. Some have heard these things over and over again. Some may have never heard. It doesn't matter. God still wants you to come back to who he made you. And if we can help you today, we have water right here. We have clothes you can put on. We have towels you can dry off with. We have everything ready. And so if you, like the Ethiopian, are right now in your heart of hearts saying, man, that sounds really good. That sounds like a life I could live. Then God wants you home today. He wants you home right now. And if you understand that, the only one that keeps you from that is you. This morning, as we sing a great song about trusting and obeying, is it the day for you to be renamed by God, to come back to the one who made you and live the way he wants you?